I think the, the biggest lesson that I've learned over time is the importance of capital preservation. And it's very easy to forget that, you know, since early 2009, we've been in this very, very long bull market, but we were actually very lucky to launch a strategy in 2007 and see a very major market crash shortly after we launched uh, the strategy. And I think sitting here today, people could become complacent uh, again, and therefore the quality of investments you, you make and the risk you take on is, is incredibly important in understanding that. But when you have such a long period, and it, making money appears pretty easy, or it has been, particularly over the last uh, six or seven years, everyone's earned good, good returns. That whole point of capital preservation, I think, is a very important uh, lesson. And therefore, be very aware of the type of risk that you're, you're, you're taking on. Another lesson I think is, is incredibly important is to make sure that you're looking out the windshield and not looking through the rear vision uh, mirror. And that, that's actually quite hard to do because often things that have worked for you in the past aren't necessarily gonna work for you in the future. And I think this is more true today than it's almost ever been before because we're gonna see over the next decade and more enormous technology disruption that is going to lead to enormous business model disruption in the world. So before I set up the Magellan, I had made an enormous amount of personal money out of investing in retailers. Yet since I've set Magellan up, investing in retailers has, has been the worst decisions I have made. Yet my previous history, that was some of the best money that I'd ever Earned. So just going back to things that have worked in the past is not necessarily telling you what's going to happen into, into the future. And there are some businesses that are fabulous businesses historically, where I think their business models are fundamentally going to change into the future. And looking into the future and understanding how this technology is going to change, but most importantly from a business po point of view, what makes a business model so strong? It could have been a business model that's worked for 30 or 40 years. But you have to look out the windshield and say, is, is the business model going to be disrupted and changed? There are some businesses in the world where that is very unlikely to happen. A water utility probably isn't going to be fundamentally disrupted. You're probably not going to have your water delivered by a drone anytime soon. Uh, we're probably not going to be uploaded to machines anytime soon. So biological goods like food, we're probably going to still need. But if you're in the car business today and you look out 10 years, most car companies we know have a high probability of being bankrupt in 10 years. Many energy companies probably have enormous terminal value risk looking out 10 years into, into the future, but oil and gas companies have been terrific investments since the invention of the in, internal combustion engine. But things are changing, and I think that's a very, very important lesson uh, that we've picked up in the last 10 years. So this whole concept of just mean revision, it's going back to the same, I think is a very dangerous concept at the moment. Well, it, let, let's split it down. In terms of a hero in my life, both Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, I think, are incredible influences in, 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 in how we, we, we think. And they, they've learned some very important lessons over time. I think they're tremendous learners of what I've just been speaking about. So Warren Buffett developed out of the Ben Graham School of Thinking, where he wanted to find really cheap investments at very cheap price to book multiples. Uh, they called it cigar butt investing. And then in the early 1970s, Charlie Munger really had a completely different vision, uh, really the vision about the power of compound interest attached to high return on equity businesses. And he convinced Warren to pay up for C's candy. And that was a fundamental change in thinking. So he, one thing that had worked for him in the past by really, really cheap things he worked out that wasn't the model to consistently get really wealthy over time. The eighth wonder of the world, as Albert Einstein has said, is compound interest. So you want to compound interest in businesses that earn high returns on capital. And Warren was out for a very long time and actually said technology he knows nothing about. 
But this year, he makes a very substantial investment, 18 billion US dollars, he invests in Apple. And Charlie Munger at this year's annual general meeting said on three or four occasions, said there is really something important that has happened this year. And he said, Warren is invested in Apple. I'll say it again, there's something really important that happened. So their ability to learn and change and adapt by looking out the windshield instead of just doing something they've done in the past and when the circumstances change, let's do something that's, uh, that's better. In terms of an influencer who talks a lot publicly about what could happen in the, in, in, uh, in the future, you could look to some futurists who, who, who talk about some, um, some big changes uh, the dangers of artificial intelligence and Nick Bostrom um, uh, would, would talk about that. Ray Kurzweil could talk about some big, big changes that would happen in the future. I, I think a true hero of mine, and we don't own Amazon shares, would have to be Jeff Bezos. I think Jeff Bezos is completely visionary in understanding how you can connect technology and a change in a business model to fundamentally change how commerce is done in the, in the world. And the more you listen to Jeff and understand what he's doing, the more you learn about what may change in the future. Well, I think the number one trend that's really important, and this may sound bizarre, we are connecting ourselves to the internet. And I don't mean by putting a prosthetic in your brain or, or, or something. What is happening here is the whole world's knowledge is being connected together by uploading all the world's knowledge into the internet. And we're starting through technology, being able to connect ourselves to the internet. The smartphone was the first development of effectively having an internet in your hand. Any information you literally want is available to you in a supercomputer in your hand. What the internet is starting to do by uploading data it's starting to not only understand what's in books and, and on maps and maybe in infantry that can connect you in a business sense, it's starting to deeply understand you. And that's why I'm saying we are starting to connect ourselves to the internet. So, so somebody like Google, a company like Google, if you ever use Google Maps and you're logged in, it knows exactly where you have been at any time. If I look up, I can go three years ago and it will tell me if you know where to go on the settings. What time did I go on a bus or did I get in a car? Was I walking? Which shop did I go into? It will tell you on the day which photos you took, which people were in those photos. So it's starting to really deeply understand individuals and, and particularly as we get more machine learning and artificial intelligence, we've got this connecting humanity, not only our knowledge through sort of this global brain, which is the internet, but it's starting to connect your personal life and this internet brain starting to really understand who you are. And I think in the future, starting to deliver deeply personal experiences. People are nervous about privacy, but this, this, this will start to really understand you and start to deliver very, very personal experiences to you. And whatever companies to, can connect through that, that connection we now have with that data can effectively start intermediating most things in your life and most commerce that you, you, you undertake. And it can start deeply disrupting business models in the world. So this, the connection of the internet to the individual before we start uploading our brains or something into it, I, th I think, and this is really what virtual reality and augmented reality and smartphones is really about. It's a really about giving you information and connecting your personal experience with this sort of internet brain that's been uh, developed. I think this is the biggest change in humanity uh, in, in over 200,000 years. It is, it is huge, it's absolutely huge, and we're just at the state where connecting the internet to the individual is really starting to happen, and the world will look very different in 10 years' time. I think what we're gonna be shocked about is how dependent we become on it, and how little privacy is gonna really matter 
in the in in the schemes of things. I think the the platform companies that really work will have most data about you. They'll have most data about businesses, but they'll have deep data about you. And in a way, it will protect that data about uh, about you. And you'll start feeling very very secure that it's delivering you this very personalised service that you can't live without. How many people are going to get rid of their smartphone today because they actually think maybe it's in it's invasive to their privacy. Maybe the government could find where you're going with the smartphone. We're not finding a lot of people who are throwing their smartphones away to be without this. They're becoming highly dependent. And I think a lot of this technology in the future, it's going to surprise us how dependent we become and how little the privacy concerns ultimately are going to, to be in the, in, the, in the future. Well, let, let, let's start. Already seven of the world's top 10 companies by market capitalization are digital platform technology companies. The largest business in the world is, is Apple, and the second largest business in the world is Alphabet, which of course owns, uh, owns, uh, owns Google. Uh, and then about the fourth largest business is now, is now Facebook. And you think about these businesses to saying is, are they already too large? Are they overvalued? And I would say they haven't even started yet. Google has really only done search-based advertising in any big monetization model at the moment. They're in very, very early stages of what I would describe as locally based relevant connections between consumers and businesses where it knows where you are, what you're like, and connecting the infantry in stores and restaurants and reviews as, you, as augmented reality and this information starts going in, the monetization model is enormous. We have an industry in the television industry, the advertising industry connected with television. It's a $200 billion a year industry. YouTube probably has about $6 billion worth of revenue. It will probably take at least half the pot in the, in, in, in the future in terms of just advertising. If you look at what's happening in autonomous driving technology, we'll probably have two operating systems in the world that will drive all the transportation in the world, a bit like what happened in mobile phones. We started with a lot and we ended with iOS and Android. These will be massively valuable digital platforms We've got an arms race going on in digital personal assistants that know immense amounts of information about you and interact in an incredibly human conversational way. We're not there yet. They're, they're kind of entertaining. They're fun to run your music and do things. But in the future, they will, they will be platforms that really start controlling your life and intermediating uh, with you. It appears that these big digital platform companies, because of the data that they already have, and the computational power that they have are so far out in front, it's very unlikely that some startup in its garage is going to get into that platform space. They may get a, a, a vertical in a particular area where they develop some artificial intelligence or some software connected with machine learning that is massive. Um, and of course, we're always looking out for those, those things. But some of these platform businesses are becoming incredibly powerful and they're only warming up in, in reality of how much commerce that they can be involved in. I think this is one of the fascinating periods. This isn't like the nifty 50s in the 19, 1960s here. Uh, and this isn't like the tech bubble in 2000 where you had businesses worth $500 billion with absolutely no earnings. There's probably one tech company out there that, 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 that doesn't really report in the earnings, Amazon, that has a very, very high market value and it's much harder to say, is it dramatically overvalued or not? That's a much harder question. But if you take something like Apple, Apple's trading on around 14 times this year's earnings at, at, at the moment. Now, you could hardly call it a nosebleed uh, valuation. You've got Google at the moment that's trading, let's try, say it's trading on next year's earnings about 23 times, I think it's trading on at the moment. It's growing between 20 and 25 percent, its core search business at the moment. It's got close on $100 billion worth of cash and it's got investments in other bets. And the other bets include things like their fiber business, their, their nest home business, very importantly, their life sciences business, but most importantly, the driverless technology uh, that they have in, 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 in Waymo. If you assume that Waymo is worth what the others may be losing, 
you could actually just call that four billion or so that they're losing a year at the moment or investing in those businesses, call it zero from a valuation point of view. You then say Google's trading at 17 or 18 times earnings for a business that's growing at 20 to 25% per annum. The S&P 500's trading at 17 times earnings at the moment. And I tell you, this has much better growth prospects and much higher quality than the S&P 500. So I would challenge that some of these things are at nosebleed valuations. And whilst they may have gone up 30% in the last year, something like Google, its earnings went up 25%. So it's actually not that much more expensive than it was the year before. And I'd say some of their technology is more advanced and more monetizable than, than it was. There are some other technology businesses that you, you may question whether they've, they've got real value or something behind them. But I, I, I'm not sure this thing that just because they've gone up 30% in a year, they're necessarily overvalued if all they're doing is tracking their earnings that have gone up by a similar percentage um, uh, year, year, year over year. And that, that's a problem is when people just look at share price graphs and things have gone up, they go, oh, they must be expensive. Things can be expensive when they go down and they can be cheap when they go up. You have to look at relative to their earnings power over time. Well, a a Amazon, I think, is one of the great businesses of the, of the world. I think Jeff Bezos is probably the business person of our generation, uh, to, to be honest. We don't own Amazon, and that's because we haven't got our mind around what we think it's worth. I think it's going to be a big, big winner in 10 years, but I have to know what return I think I'm going to earn from investing in it in today. We've now got a transparency through Amazon Web Services, which is their cloud hosting uh, business. That's probably worth a few hundred billion dollars. It's a very, very valuable business. But then the rest of Amazon is there's very little transparency around exactly what components. They're investing enormous amounts of money in parts of their business, particularly as they're building out fulfillment around the world and entering um, uh, uh, new, new markets. So we, we just can't confidently say what rate of return we think we would earn. So we don't have a view whether it's overvalued or undervalued. And if we don't have a view, we don't invest. Um, it, it's as simple as that. But first of all, these digital platform companies, and I would add the payments businesses as well, businesses like Visa Card and MasterCard and PayPal, that, that we own in the world, none of these exist in Australia. Okay, so if you want to buy those, that type of thing of where the world's headed, you simply can't invest in that in Australia. But you're asking a more fundamental question about kind of either owning Australia or owning the market. I, I have a very strong emerging view that the centre of the markets are going to be hollowed out over the next decade. So owning the whole market, whether it's in Australia or owning the S&P 500, there are going to be whole industries that are either wiped out or whose terminal value is dramatically reduced over, uh, over time. And that's because of business model disruption risk. The auto companies will probably get wiped out. Many retailers in the world will probably get wiped out through the Amazon effect. Autonomous driving electric vehicles will, be, will wipe out many auto companies. A whole lot of energy companies will probably have much lower valuations a decade from now than they have have today, a lot of mining, coal sort of mining companies would be in that same uh, uh, category. Um, you could think of other businesses that maybe won't get disrupted, which you could put in another category. But businesses, and I talked about this whole thing about mean revision and learning and looking out the windshield. An example I often give is a business like Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble is the world's largest household products company. It has the most formidable brand portfolio you can imagine. They own Pantene and Head & Shoulders shampoos. They own the number one laundry detergent in the United States with their 50% market share, a brand called Tide. Uh, they own Olay, they own Gillette. They own Pampers in, in, in nappies. It's just incredible. And they're the world's largest advertising firm. So they've got the number one or two brands in most big categories, biggest advertiser in the world. And it's been such a fantastic business because of the business model. The business model is advertising, predominantly television, as the largest advertiser in the world. They get to dominate the share of mind. And believe it or not, advertising works. If you're out there with some ad and your sheets are in the breeze and they're all white and everything else and in the United States, when you walk into a supermarket and you've been advertised Tide, because they're the number one brand, they've got 30 feet of Tide in a Walmart. So when you go, it's this partnership between advertising and a traditional retail model. 
through these digital platform companies, traditional advertising, television advertising is being ripped up. That model is fundamentally not going to be economic in the future and therefore trying to dominate television advertising isn't going to necessarily give you the winning brand because now through social media and, and, and both Google and, and, and Facebook are giving entry points much easier for upcoming brands. So this defence, because you're the world's largest advertiser, doesn't that business model isn't a defence anymore. And this whole thing that you're going to go and buy your laundry detergent in 10 years' time in a Woolworths or a Walmart that business model is probably going to be ripped up by someone called Amazon, who's going to have the internet of things connected to your home with automatic fulfillment, and is probably going to use its digital assistants, which they're already doing on the Echo platform of Alexa, to never even offer you that choice. You go, you go onto Alexa at the moment and, and try and order a, a, a battery, you can't find a Duracell on the Alexa platform, which is Amazon. Uh, at, at, at the moment. So in the future, we would say that, 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 that the Tide brand's going to lose more and more volume over time, and therefore Procter & Gamble's earnings in 10 years' time are probably going to be lower, and the multiple that the market applies to it, which averaged 20 times over the last 10 to 15 years, it may be materially lower. So again, this is this lesson about looking out the windshield. So even things you think are the most formidable things, may not be formidable in the, in the future. And I call, it, call that terminal value risk. So this whole thing of just investing in Australia, you have to say, is, does Australia have the composition of the things that are either going to be highly defensive? Yes, we've got some of those winning digital platforms. We don't have any of those. And I would say you have to have a meaningful amount of your money invested in, 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 in that space. And there's a whole lot of stuff that's worked in the past, a bit like my lessons from retailing, worked for me in the past, but it kind of didn't work in the last seven years. I think there's going to be more of those things that emerge where the business models get disrupted and what worked in the past may well not work in the future. First of all, I would say in terms of driverless cars, we're going to have an enormous amount of real estate that is freed up from car parking. Car parking is even more costly than the car it, it itself. So even at homes, people will not need the car park at their house and within cities, you will not need all the car parking on streets and the car parking uh, 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 stations. So when that real estate becomes available, I don't know what exactly happens to prices, but it's an enormous amount of real estate that gets freed up. I think in, in Los Angeles, it's estimated, I think you could, you could fit five San Francisco's into the freed up space in Los Angeles from car parks being removed. So we're not talking, Los Angeles is kind of a bit off the scale. They don't have any public transportation. The car parks are everywhere. It's not quite like that in Sydney. But even then, it's a very, very large amount of the urban space that is taken up in car parking. And if we move to a world, particularly if it's transport as a service where you don't own your own car, so your car's not going back to your own house in your own garage, if it's truly a shared fleet for many people in society, and the economics are very, very compelling for transport as a service, I think you'll have a massive amount of very prime real estate in Point Piper being freed up by not having car parks. Uh, virtual reality is an experience where it is indistinguishable from reality. So once you're in a virtual world, it would be indistinguishable from the real world. I don't think we will be at full virtual reality in that in maybe in the next 10 years. But if you looked out 20 years, if we get to a full virtual reality experience, there's no need to go to an office in that world because in a virtual reality world you could have a full office experience sitting in a tiny little room at home. Uh, anywhere in the world you could be in a virtual office with all your colleagues but never be in the office. You could actually go on a holiday in a virtual world as well. Um, and I, I think there'll be multiple virtual worlds as well as and virtual offices that people May, may, may go to. So I think a huge shift in society, where you spend your time, how you spend your time, where you go to work uh, in the future. So this whole thing of going into large office buildings, going to work every single day in the way that, that we do it, I think virtual reality has the potential to completely change that paradigm 
uh, into, in, into the future, far more than augmented reality. But it's augmented reality that's coming first. Virtual reality will be for games and things and watching movies uh, initially. But a full virtual reality experience, maybe in 10 to 20 years' time, could start fundamentally changing these questions about what type of real estate is needed, where you go to work, how you experience holidays, how you educate children, could be fundamentally different. Thank <laughs> you.